Hello, everyone, and happy Thursday. Let's see which direction am I? There we go. Sorry, I'm late. A couple of uh, issues with Microsoft. Gotta love computers and technology, you know. Um, thanks so much for joining me today, and thank you for being patient if you're still sticking around. If I catch you on the recording, hopefully you're relaxing and, and having a good time. So my name's Rob, and today we are going to talk about the top five mistakes that running stores make online and how you can avoid them. So I think this conversation requires a little bit of background. Back in 2019, and this is kind of crazy that this is the case, back in 2019, 27% of run specialty retailers in the RIA's retailer survey reported having an e-commerce presence. That's pretty low, generally speaking, for retail in 2019. Fast forward to Christmas of 2020 slash early 2021, and that number explodes to 90%. Now, obviously, this effect was a direct result of the pandemic, which led to lockdowns, which led to the largest shift in consumer buying behavior since the invention of the credit card. For the most part, everybody scrambled to get online as a means of survival. And in a perfect storm, all of us who were locked into the house with our families 24-7 realized that running was a really great way to keep ourselves from murdering everyone that we live with, to be totally frank about it. And I know everyone that is listening knows exactly what I'm talking about. So the industry saw this, this massive spike in revenue right about the time we all expected to be struggling, and a big part of that revenue spike came from online sales. Yay. This perfect storm kind of a scenario where you had brand new entrants into the online world greeted with hungry customers who had no other channel to engage gave a lot of running stores the false impression that as long as they had an e-commerce store sitting on the internet, they were maximizing their online presence. This resulted in an environment where no one had to learn the best practices to be successful online because just being there made you successful at the time. Absolutely the case. And since everybody was new, they didn't realize that there were best practices that they needed to look into. And of course, as things started opening up and people were desperate to get out of the house and see other humans um, that they don't share a bathroom with, the blazing hot fire of run specialty e-commerce cooled a little bit and it left some store owners wondering what to do and questioning the value of an online presence in the first place. Meanwhile, behind the facade of this innocent looking bookstore, you had a world full of customers who as a whole adopted online as an important way of interacting with the brands they love. The holdouts fell through and gave in when COVID hit. PwC, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, I don't know if they call themselves that any longer, but that's every time I see PwC, that's what I think. They published a survey in 2021 that found that at that time, the use of smartphones for online shopping had more than doubled since 2018. They also cited commentary from these same respondents to this survey that clearly signaled consumers didn't think they'd go back to their old ways of shopping once the pandemic was over. Spoiler alert, they didn't. And you may not realize it, but neither did you. Think about it. Unless you're among a tiny minority of people, less than 3% according to Google, what's the first thing you do when you need information? It doesn't matter what the subject is, whether it's did Lance actually know Caballo Blanco, how many ounces are in a gallon, or which Mexican restaurants are in my vicinity, you go online and you conduct a search. Well, so does 97% of the rest of humanity. The experience plays out like this. You go to Google, you search for a store near you that might carry an item you need, and you give them a quick once over. And if 
you find what seems interesting, you head over to that store and make a purchase. And, and of course, you're not alone in this experience at all. It turns out that 76% of people who conduct a local search on Google set foot in a physical store they discovered in those search results within 24 hours. So alert, lo, oh my gosh. So a local search on Google means that you type in something near me. So if I typed in, how do bees make honey? That's not a local search. But if I typed in running store near me, local search. I'm looking for something physically located near me. So why am I blathering about all this? Because in 2023, your potential customers will have their first exposure to your running store almost exclusively online. All of them. 97% of them. And if you aren't showing the same loving care and concern for your brand's presentation in the digital world as you do in the physical one, you're shooting yourself in the foot. It's not just about e-commerce either. It's about showing up in your Sunday best in the very first, I can't talk today, in the very first place people go to size you up. They explain, they all right, deep breath here, Anderson. They expect a glimpse into your store's personality and into your community, and they expect to find all the products that you sell on an e-commerce store, even if they actually buy from you in person. This is an absolute. This leads us to the top five mistakes that running stores make online and how you can avoid them. Now, I may be a little cheeky about things, in this discussion just for fun, but the reality is that unless somebody sits down and explains how all this digital stuff differs from the physical world of retail and generally speaking, the physical world, most of it isn't exactly intuitive. So if you're guilty of any or all of these things, no judgment here. Our crazy circumstances in 2020 didn't exactly give anyone the tools they needed to navigate this stuff in the first place. And it's better to understand best practices and adjust behavior than it is to wonder what the heck you're supposed to do next. So the, the, the spirit of this is, hey, we've seen a bunch of this stuff before, and here's what you can avoid, and it will make a material difference. Hopefully, you hear it that way. So without further ado, number five. And of course, we're going to count down from the least impactful to the most, although all are impactful. I've tried nothing and I'm all out of ideas. So I will go ahead and publicly admit that I thought the movie Field of Dreams was awesome. But it gave us the one phrase that every marketer on the face of the earth reviles with a passion. And it's actually incorrect, technically. And that is, if you build it, they will come. The actual quote was, if you build it, he will come. There's a big argument online about that, which I found fascinating. Didn't realize that until I was researching for this video. Um, but in the end, that phrase came from that movie. And unfortunately, we all fall victim to this misguided philosophy, whether we're Generation X or not. Every time I stream on this channel, my brain convinces me that I'm on a stage in front of thousands of people, even though most of the time, the only person in the audience is Mark from Utah Run. Thanks, Mark. It's natural for us to make the leap of assuming that something feels big and important to us, so it must also feel big and important to everybody else. I do it with my hair. Looking decent today, a little grayer than, than usual, but imagine that. If I get into my car after I go to the grocery store and I see that my hair's messed up in the rear view mirror, I get embarrassed because my natural inclination is to believe that my hair being messed up is as impactful to everybody else around me as it is to me. But the reality is, is that nobody cares and, and nobody noticed. And it's not personal to me. It's just kind of how reality works. And this holds true in the online universe too. The e-commerce bubble that we all experienced in 2020 channeled our inner Kevin Costners, if you will. And most of us lived assuming that since we built it, they would come. And just like my hair and this live stream, the reality is that in normal 
st- in normal circumstances, no one notices. And again, it's not personal. It's just the state of things. So if you build a cool new website and stand up a kick-ass e-commerce store and then wait for the orders to come rolling in, you're going to be disappointed. Bottom line. Why? It's actually a really good question, and it requires some consideration of perspective. First, what is the ecosystem that we're working in? In other words, what does the world of online actually look like, and how do our potential customers behave there? What do they do to intersect that behavior with the magic that is our brand that we know we're, that they're going to love? Well, almost everyone who isn't already shopping with you starts their journey on Google. Yes, I know people use Bing and pre-search, but not many and not enough to be relevant to this conversation. When they go to Google, they're going to do some combination of the following. Either A, they're going to flat out look for a running store near them with a local search. They're going to ask a question in the search bar that you might be uniquely qualified to answer, like, do I need trail runners for the Ridgeline Trail at Crowder's Mountain? Or they may seek to engage the running community by searching for half marathons in May. When you ask yourself, what should I be doing online to get more traffic? Remember that this one interaction is where you should put your focus. How? Well, if I can get my system to work, I'll show you. First, make sure that your Google <laughs> that your Google business profile is dialed in and that you're asking your customers for reviews. It's not just about reviews. I've got a video, I'll put it the link to it in the description that steps through everything with the Google business profile, but reviews really does help quite a bit. Second, make sure that you write a blog every week or every two weeks if you're busy. The blog, and this is really important, the blog is meant to give you a place to write up answers to questions that your prospective customers might enter into Google. So when they do, you're the running store that shows up first. That's all it's for. Your blog is your most powerful SEO tool, hands down. And finally, be sure your community activities can be easily attributed back to your website to talk about it. Even though there's might be an official sign up link on some bank's social media account or something, if your name is part of, of an event or some community association, you should be tying that association back to your website every single time. In other words, make an event page for the big marathon that you're sponsoring that's actually really run by the bank. Or create a blog post that talks about how great it was to participate in X, Y, and Z activity put on by Home Depot this weekend. Whatever it is, attributing your participation in the community on your website will help bring traffic to that website. And exercising some discipline around these three things will totally transform the return on investment that you get from your online presence, both in-store and, of course, online. Number four. Starting with unrealistic expectations. So there's this weird thing that happens in the tech world where the easier a technology is to use, the more complex it is uh, from an underpinning systems and processes perspective. This is true because it requires a ton of engineering effort to manipulate technology to conform to the way that humans think and behave. So Steve Jobs, back in 1981, he was doing an interview with Bob Brown, uh, who I think it was ABC that they were with, uh, said this better than I can. That's the paradox in our industry right now. To make a computer simpler requires a more sophisticated computer. Today, technology is easier to use than it's ever been. 
even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it. It's more powerful in terms of capability than it's ever been, and the engineering and hardware that sits behind the scenes is more complex than it's ever been. So what happens is, if you're not really familiar with the technical complexity that's involved in making things feel easy as a user, you can easily and inadvertently set unrealistic expectations for that technology. Now in the land of running stores, this often rears its head in a situation where the user, that's you, expects a system to conform to the way they think and behave because it seems easy in theory to do it that way. So what am I talking about? Well, when we, the developers say of, of Run Free Projects platform, decide to build some function on the platform, we have a bunch of constraints that we have to consider in order to effectively thread the needle to give you an easy to use feature that actually functions. So first we have to find common ground between all the point of sale systems we integrate with because every action on run free is intrinsically tied to your point of sale system. Now each POS is a lot different than their peers. So finding that common denominator is actually a pretty big challenge in and of itself. And of course it has to work the same across all of them, right? Second, we have to be sure that any systems that we plan to connect to in order to build this feature are able to communicate with us in a way that meets our users' needs and that meets the needs of all the other systems that we have to connect to. So shipping systems, payment systems, tax systems, um, your app, Strava, whatever it is, we have to consider all those different connections and combinations of connections. Third, we have to make sure that whatever solution we find for these challenges can scale massively to the thousands of users simultaneously degree. This is a lot harder than it might seem. The scale piece is the one that, that is more difficult than you would expect. Um, and, and finally, we have to make sure that whatever solutions we find for the three challenges that I just mentioned, it's a user-friendly and intuitive solution that can be as easy as possible for you guys to use when we release it. This means that sometimes the product of this process works a little differently than you might expect it to from your individual perspective and your expectation. And if your expectations are inflexible, um, you'll find yourself frustrated with technology a lot. And this isn't just for run free. I'm just using run free as an example because I know it. Um, this is every piece of technology that you interact with. All the people behind that tech have to wrestle with these really complex challenges. So the best practice here and the takeaway from this mistake is recognize that there are functional constraints to all technology and try to be open to the idea of shifting the way you expect something to work to match the way it works best given those immovable constraints. In other words, at least in, in Run Free's case, and I think this is probably the case with any software developer, the, the intent is to design something that is as intuitive as possible for everyone to use. Sometimes your individual intuition may be slightly different than somebody else's, or it's not technically possible to meet that intuition. And so there's sort of a give and take between expectations and deliverability. And when you're open-minded around that, it makes it a lot less frustrating of a process to deal with. Uh, with technology. So number three, this, now we're really getting into the meat of things, misunderstanding the online engagement model. So I've already touched on this kind of loosely, but I want to be sure that we give this mistake its proper place. So many people get this wrong and understanding how the engagement model works and why will really help you prioritize where you focus your energy when it comes to driving more visibility to your brand. Now, I'm going to use this um, little funnel here because it's easier to visualize as long as I can keep this running without crashing on me. Uh, at the top of the funnel, you have your entry point. This is the first touch prospects. Uh, these are the people who see or interact with your running store brand for the very first time. Your goal with this group is to entice them to engage further. Now down the funnel a little bit further are your customers. Most of them had a great first experience with you and now they shop with you when they need a new pair of shoes or a few goo packets or whatever. 
Slightly further down, you have your engaged community. These customers define your brand. They consider you an important part of their lives and they include you and your brand identity as part of their own identities. The folks in this little section are the reason that we all love this industry so much. They're at every race. They've got your hat on when you see them in the grocery store and they stop by the shop just to say hi on occasion if they happen to be in the area. Each of these groups of people tends to use different channels of engagement to interact with your brand. The top of funnel group, the first touch prospects, engage you almost exclusively through online search. A very small percentage of this group stumbles upon your brand while they're out in the community and even smaller sliver hear about you through word of mouth. If you want to get this group's attention, you need to be focused on showing up when they do an online search. Down the funnel to your customers, again, these are the folks who know you exist and if they had a good first experience, they're likely to shop with you again. They interact with your brand primarily through your marketing efforts, emails, push notifications, or texts, nurture streams as, as some folks call them. Sometimes if they're really stoked about your store, they'll follow you on social media too. If you wanna get this group's attention, you should be focused on messaging through those direct contact channels like email, push notifications, and text. And when it comes to your engaged community, they're interacting with you primarily through social media and in person. They personify the spirit of your brand. They boost and amplify who you are, um, and, and they participate in presenting your running store's priceless community experience to the world. You don't really have to engage them. They're already engaged. You want to give them the tools to convert the customer that's higher up in the funnel into fellow community members because that's where the real value comes in. Running stores in the communities in their orbit are absolutely phenomenal at this piece, particularly on Instagram. This selection of the funnel is where the industry really shines. So when you think about your goals, think about which of these three groups you want the attention of, and then go about gaining that potential in the channel that they tend to choose most. So in other words, it is an unrealistic expectation to think that at the top of the funnel, this group who has yet to have their first touch with your store is going to have that experience on Facebook or Instagram. They're going to go search. So focus on being in their search results if you want to be on their radar. This divergent set of entry points is one of the most useful components to the online universe. So use it wisely, young Padawan. My, my final comment on the engagement model is this. You should also aim to drive people down funnel. You want to be sure those first touch people become customers and you want to entice those customers to become part of your core community. And you do that by showing the world who you are first and what you sell second. More on that in just a little bit. Numero dos. Assuming e-commerce doesn't matter. This one always gets me. Um, I hear some version of this every single day and I, I understand where the thought process comes from, but unfortunately it is just plain wrong. The thinking goes like this. I set up an e-commerce store. It was great during the pandemic, but now it doesn't account for much of our revenue, so I'm not sure I want to invest any more of my time or effort into it. Completely reasonable line of thinking. So when you kind of zoom out and look at the situation, there is a bit of a chicken and egg thing that's going on. Um, and that is, if your e-commerce store's user experience is bad because it's slow to load or the gift cards that people bought in your store don't work online, um, is it the nature of e-commerce itself that's the problem or is it the e-commerce site that's the problem? It's worth considering and I don't know the answer. But the real mistake here is the faulty thinking that e-commerce's value is tied explicitly to the revenue that comes through online sales. Regardless of whether or not your current e-commerce solution sucks, the unchangeable reality is that almost every single person who has never shopped with you before, whether that's in-store or online, is going to find you online first. This will be how it works from here on out, too. 
Mark my words, people aren't unusing the internet over time. We're becoming more and more entrenched from a daily life perspective in the internet and online search is a massive part of that. We all know. And when that first contact happens, when that prospect is investigating your running store brand, they're going to go to your e-commerce site and look around. Most of them are going to come to your store to make purchases and some of them will complete purchases on your e-commerce site itself. But most of the people who buy from your e-commerce site are in the bottom two sections of the funnel that we just talked about. They're your existing customers in your community. It's actually kind of rare for someone who finds you for the first time to buy from your e-commerce store. Most of the time, they're going to come in and poke around first. But, and this is the most important part, if you don't have an e-commerce store, or if your e-com site is slow, or uninviting or hard to navigate on a mobile device or something like that, you won't ever get the opportunity to earn their business in the first place. They'll go somewhere else that has an e-commerce site or at least one that's easy to browse. And if nothing changes, you'll never know you lost that opportunity. You'll continue to believe e-commerce doesn't matter, perpetuating this second most common mistake and placing a very hard ceiling on your potential. That is absolutely how reality works in 2023 and that reality is very loosely connected to the number of dollars that are processed by your e-commerce site directly so don't make this common mistake you're leaving a ton of potential on the table by dismissing the importance of e-commerce in the customer journey especially when it comes to your brand new customers if all you're thinking about is the revenue number that the e-commerce site itself brings in it plays a pivotal role in every single new face that darkens that door. Number one, the number one mistake that running, running stores make online, and the number one mistake that I make uh, giving this talk, focus on the wrong things. This is the number one worst mistake running stores make online, and real talk, y'all, you don't own a running store because you lack enthusiasm. I think we can all agree. <laughs> uh, you're a fighter. You dig deep. You do hard things. That's literally the ethos behind your entire career and probably your existence. Uh, honestly, it's inspirational. It's one of the reasons I love this industry so much. I like to consider myself to be cut from the same cloth, but um, then I see Steve Moore's 5K time in Austin. And I realize that I will never be as fast as any of you, but I digress. <laughs> One of the themes in these top five mistakes really is just misguided energy expenditure. It's not incompetence. It's just a matter of not having the context to point yourself in the optimal direction. And as I mentioned earlier, that context typically comes from the hard knocks of slowly bringing up your brand online in normal times, not from doing so in a super short period of time during an explosive online bubble in the middle of a pandemic. Basically, we all got a brand new hot rod and nobody taught us how to drive stick. Thus, this focusing on the wrong things is so common that it's actually kind of hard to encompass in this short form context, but I'm gonna try to hit some of the high points and hopefully you'll start smelling what I'm cooking. One of the first things store owners do when they start with Run Free is focus an insane amount of time on rearranging product categories and their relationships to one another. And to be fair, we incentivize this because our platform pulls everything from the point of sale system in and you have to simplify it for public consumption anyway. But the trouble starts when polishing for public consumption becomes a complex web of run specialty categories and relationships. It is so easy to fall into the trap of spending a ton of time creating a bunch of nested categories, but unfortunately, it's time that could be better spent elsewhere. Product categories are definitely very important to running stores, but customers rarely navigate e-commerce store use e-commerce stores using product categories, not in the way you think. Um, very rarely. Instead, they come to your homepage, they look at the calls to action that you have in the form of banners. They quickly look over the very general square tile categories um, that you have and that are right there front and center and then click one and then they search for whatever they're looking for or they browse from that point. 
as a running store, you're better off throwing together a super simple, mega high level, flat list of categories than spending the time you would have spent polishing their relationships on creating a store homepage with meaningful calls to action. When your customers come to your online store, they're looking for you to tell them what to do. They want an introduction to who you are and what you feel is valuable. That's the most important baseline concept that you can focus on, making that path easy to see for them. So when you go to running stores who, have, who, are, who are performing well online, you'll see that most are leading the prospect from the moment they land on that page, whether it's a call to action to check out um, you know, something that they have going on from an event perspective or you know, gift cards or if it's branded material. I mean, you guys know your store's branded stuff is super popular. That says everything you need to know about what your customers value most about you, right? So remember, focus less on the specifics of the categories and how they're nested together and more on what you're saying to your customer about where they should go when they land on your e-commerce homepage. The next one, you're probably very tired of hearing me talk about, and that's SEO. Let me go on the record and say that SEO is bullshit. It's so insanely complex that no reasonable person could ever be expected to master it, and the boundaries between what actually matters and what doesn't are almost impossible to see without special insider information that can only be gained by you know, hiking the highest mountain on every continent. It's bullshit. So it should come as no surprise that a lot of stores lose their way when trying to dial in their SEO. And not just running stores, this is like the biggest challenge for literally anybody online. People will go to a marketing agency, that agency will run an audit, and then the audit will tell you how much you suck and then give you a mountain of tiny little things that you can adjust to be back in the good graces of the internet. You spend thousands of hours and maybe thousands of dollars making those adjustments only to find that six months, six months later, nothing has changed and your site activity is pretty much the same as it was before you went through all that nonsense with SEO. And the reason is those little adjustments aren't really where you need to be focusing your SEO efforts. Do they matter? Yes, to some degree. But when you're starting to process of improving your SEO, that's the last place that you want to begin. In, in running terms, um, think of it like this. So let's say I came into your store and I said, I want the best shoes, the best nutrition, and the most lightweight but effective means of hydration that you have. I'm running a marathon tomorrow. And then you ask me, awesome, congratulations. So how's your training been going? And my response is, well, I haven't trained yet. I've never run before. You're going to stand there and very carefully tell me that I need to cancel my registration for the race and then you're going to give me a primer on how to train for a marathon. Part of that explanation is going to include something to the effect of the training is the most important part of this process. It'll be what ultimately determines your success or failure. And even though the gear matters, it doesn't necessarily matter if you haven't done the training part first. That's exactly what's happening with SEO. I did a long video, actually like three long videos about this because I feel incredibly passionately that A, SEO is bullshit and it's not fair that it's a hurdle that everybody has to jump through and B, this technique works. I've seen it work time and time again and it's not as hard as you would think. Links in the description to check it out, please do. Um, there's no cost to doing this SEO optimization work at all and you certainly don't ever have to be a run free customer so I'm not trying to sell you anything um, in the end your success is our success and so all boats always rise um, the short version of this story is this intent is everything your newest prospects are going to discover you on online by searching for something that you've published the answer to on your website remember 
97% of consumers find the running store, find a running store. They discover you for the very first time online. They're going to Google and searching. And when they search, Google is going and looking for the answers to whatever they search for. And your hope in the stuff that you do to optimize your SEO is that you'll show up in those search results. To maximize this potential, you need to focus on two things. One, your Google business profile. That's the first place almost every person who's looking for a running store near them is going to go. And two, publishing a blog on your site on a regular basis. I know I've already said this, but I, I cannot focus on this enough. If you can swing it, publish it once a week. If not, go for bi-weekly. Regardless, a blog is the most powerful SEO tool there is. Now, the object isn't to say something that's going to attract a whole bunch of people the day you publish it. Uh, you probably won't get any traffic at all the day you publish it. Um, the object is to carefully prepare the answers to questions that people who may not know you exist could be asking Google, where you would be the one to provide the best response. In doing so, you increase your running store's visibility to search engines dramatically, increasing the potential that they'll send traffic your way. And this increase happens over time as you repeat the blogging process and prove to Google that you're the best at answering your potential customers' questions. The more Google senses that the answer to whatever your potential customers' questions are being answered best by you, the higher the likelihood is that Google's going to put you at the top of the list. And, and blogging is the easiest way to do it. Keyword research, figuring out kind of where to start and what those questions might be. There's a video on that that I did as well. We did a little workshop together. Um, and you can sit down with your staff, friends, family, and, and go through this workshop yourself. And it'll give you a lot of direction on, on where to go. If you do nothing else, blog. Well, Google business profile and then your blog. One last point here and then I'll stop. Um, as search engines get better, they're going to adjust how they determine what is SEO optimized and what isn't. They're always going to trend towards trying to provide the most relevant, real, human readable content possible. And by focusing on actually answering real questions from people who could actually benefit from your knowledge and might shop with you too, you're free. <laughs> You're future-proofing your online presence. Uh, if you're making meta tag adjustments and adding alt descriptions to 40,000 images, that's only going to matter in the short term. Once the, sh once the search engines evolve, it's likely the technical settings will either change or completely fall off of the radar from an impact perspective. Um, ask anyone who did SEO professionally in 2017 how they did it. And you'll hear a lot of talk about bolded keywords and keyword spacing and word count and t blog titles and all that stuff. And, you know, just like the great gear with the marathon situation I was talking about, sure, it matters. But human readability and answers to questions that are being asked in Google is how you do it now. And all that time that people like me spent trying to make sure that keywords were in the exact right place with the exact surroundings that they needed to have to be technically optimized, completely wasted if, if none of that stuff answers anybody's questions because in 2023, none of that matters anymore. So, okay, sorry about the SEO soapbox. I feel very strongly about this and you should too. Let's talk about ads. So everybody runs ads online to some degree. Ads are effective if done properly and a humongous waste of money if approached from the wrong direction. Think back to that funnel from a few minutes ago. When you run ads, which group are you speaking to? And this is a question, like a legitimate question, not just a rhetorical. Um, which group do you want to speak to? And most importantly, which other retailers are you competing with if you're competing with any? So, Let's say I decide that I want to run a set of ads. Before I get into this, most of this stuff is very much like the training for a marathon thing. Um, I'm not getting ready to tell you that you shouldn't be running ads for new shoes. Um, that would be a ridiculous thing for me to say. 
But prioritizing where you spend your energy when you're putting effort into this stuff is really what I'm talking about. So let's say that I want to run ads for the new Ghost 15 on Facebook and Instagram. I get them all set up and let her rip. Hey you, buy the men's Ghost 15 from Intergalactic Running Company. It goes out to thousands or hundreds of thousands of users. But in the end, you only end up getting like 15 sales to come from that ad. And you probably go, WTF is that all about? It's super frustrating. And here's why that happens. Because ads are just like search engines. You are competing with everyone else who's trying to say the same thing you are. If what you're saying isn't unique to you, the odds that you're competing for the spotlight with more retailers who have more money to spend rises exponentially. Everyone carries the Ghost 15 and everyone's running ads on social media for it. How can you expect to outspend Dick Sporting Goods on Ghost 15 ad exposure? You can't. So what do you do? Well, you don't just stop running ads, but maybe focus on what you bring to the table that is unique instead. Focus more. Advertise your running store brand. Remember, ultimately, you want to invite people from the upper part of that funnel to join the folks further down the funnel as members of your community. If you advertise the value of you, your brand's personality, your values, the store experience, the wild and rowdy people who never miss a group run on pint night, you're not competing with anyone and you're espousing the real value that you bring to your customers. Everybody that sits in that community at the bottom of the funnel, when you ask them why they love your running store, it's extremely unlikely that they're going to say because they had the Ghost 15. It's probably going to have a lot more to do with everything that makes you, you. You haven't been successful in this industry for 30 years because you happen to have the newest footwear in stock. You've been successful because you're offering a value in the form of your community. If you made an ad that showed, and I'm just making this up, right? But hopefully it makes it makes sense as I say it. Um, if you made an ad that showed a POV video of a customer walking through the front door and being greeted by your smiling staff and a message of, you know, hey, we've been running in the Charlotte area for decades. We love our community and we're really excited to help you in whatever way we can. If you want the personal touch and a sense of belonging, come to our store. And then you lead them to your website to expand on that message and you happen to be selling Ghost 15s at the same time. I'm betting that you're going to have way more success with that method because you're leading with your brand first. So important. So important. So please remember, anything that you're doing online, anything that you're paying for online, you're going to be competing in a very similar fashion to the search engines. So the, the, the more unique the message you can get with value, the better off you're going to be. So last little point, and then I'll shut up and we can all go back to our day. A lot of folks will mischaracterize web traffic metrics by examining the numbers like they might examine customer counts walking into the store. So in other words, let's, let's say that you have 2000 visitors to your e-commerce homepage in a month, but only 20 made purchases. There is a deep natural desire to believe that those 2000 visits could somehow be purchases if only you presented your products in the right way on that landing page. And that's not really how it works. Again, there are some gradients. We're sort of talking about that whole marathon analogy that I used earlier. Um, it's not a perfect analog, but it's reasonable. Really, in the end, it is, of course, important for you to have a good working site that's easy to navigate. And, you know, if you don't, then that skewed set of metrics might be a sign of that. But if your site works well, is easy to navigate. Don't spend all of your time trying to turn those 2,000 site visitors into customers with fancy plugins and tiny product description adjustments. It doesn't work. A massive number of those 2,000 visitors came to your site completely randomly, either because they're bots 
or because they did a search for something totally unrelated and landed on you by accident. Uh, but instead of running shoes, they needed a lawnmower, so they left. Your, your site visit number and its relationship to the number of people who made purchases is, for all intents and purposes, irrelevant. I promise. You will find a substantially higher return on your investment, both of time and money, by focusing on driving engagement throughout that funnel instead. If you make your brand's value more visible and you make it easier to engage with that value, you will win. What I mean is before you spend you know, 500 more dollars a month on some fancy site plugin, consider using that money in a different way, a way that helps you amplify your message to your customers and prospects. Your aim should be engaging the people outside and drawing them in, not trying to convince the ones who came in and chose to leave to stay. Now, hopefully, guys, I know that that was a ton of info. Um, I, I tried to make it as concise as possible um, and, and as direct as possible. As an industry, we have undergone an unbelievably massive transformation since uh, 2020. And everybody, all of us, all participants in the industry are doing the best that we can to try and elevate one another. That is one of the magical things about being a part of this thing is that it's like a family. I mean, the the hands-on community feel that running stores try to portray to their customers exists because the people behind that believe that that's how people should be treated. And we try to do the same thing because we also believe that same thing. And, and in the spirit of, you know, helping one another and, and making sure that, that all boats rise, these common mistakes, understanding them and why they're made, how they're made and how you can avoid them will help you. Next week, we're going to talk about the top five things that running stores do right online because it's not all doom and gloom. You guys are doing a really fantastic job. There are some amazing, amazing brands out there. And in particular, you guys absolutely shred it on, on Instagram. You completely understand exactly what Instagram is there to do. And, and you engage with Instagram as an industry better than any other guaranteed. It's, it's, absolutely phenomenal and and instagram really does kind of touch that bottom of the funnel and and that sort of second the bottom half of that second level of the funnel getting engaging the very top of that funnel is the part that is the most unnatural for for running stores online because it it's the least intuitive um and and so taking notes about how to engage that top of funnel will will be what helps you the most and and remember Almost everyone discovers you exist by searching online. So make sure that you're presenting your best self when they finally do find you and, and you'll be good to go. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I, I really, really do appreciate it. I know that I was a couple minutes late and I apologize. Hopefully this was useful information to you. As always, um, like and subscribe, throw us a couple of comments, give us some suggestions. Um, Eric, thank you for the phenomenal idea to go through these top five common mistakes so that you could avoid them. I thought that was great. So I stole the idea from you. Uh, shout out. And we'll see you again next week. Cheers, all.